We are live! <laughs> Welcome to Live Lunch. We are on um, season three, episode five. Wow, we're getting through them quick, aren't mm. we? I feel like this is our 31st episode. I think, mm, don't quote yeah. me on this. Um, I, I think we are on our 31st episode. You're worried about being well, fact box set? Like, <laughs> you're doing like Netflix box set, so we could work our way through the series. And yeah. Yeah, This is a season three. Wow. So yeah, how do I do that? How do I go back and read? How do I, how do I binge? Again? Really good question. I'm so glad you asked. If yeah, you like to watch previous uh, Live Lunch bad. episodes, they're all on was YouTube. No, it wasn't. Um, all on YouTube, all on Spotify. Search for Live Lunch on Spotify and it should bring you up all the previous episodes or on YouTube. Oh, exciting. All the previous uh, So you could spend your entire weekend watching Any personal back to back. Any and personal greats? Personal favourites that we Whoa. should go for. Wow, you sprung this on us. I really enjoyed doing the Christmas one. That was good, it's sorry. a Christmas special. Yeah, that was a Christmas special. Oh, I've missed all this. I've been too busy fun. working yeah. in the church, serving yeah. everyone. That's what it is, so carry on. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself, because you mm. preached on Sunday. But so. before Steve starts talking, we've got lunch. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yeah. Burgers from Jobs is a new place that's opened on Hove. Uh, did we get any information? Our wonderful intern, Chubbs. Joe, went and got us some food from Chubbs. You become what uh, you eat. Nothing beyond it. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Right there, called Joseph. <laughs> Where is he? Yeah. So Joseph served Joseph. He did. Thank you, no. Joseph, for yeah, serving well, us well, burgers. We are grateful. Welcome to the neighborhood. Woohoohoo! Smells glorious. Sorry, Steve, over to you. Oh. Well, yeah, I can't, I can't eat a chip now. So what did, the question was... What do you do? What do I do? Okay. Um, I now work for the church, have been for about about 15 years, I think. Um, I was nursing before that, and pretty well from the moment I came full time, I have been responsible for the pastoral care of the church. Doing Um, a great job. Thank you very much. That's what I do. You've done like 50 triathlons or something, silly little, haven't you? Oh, well, I did. I did a lot of triathlons before becoming a Christian, but because they happened on a Sunday, that was something I had to sort of give up. Steve. But I have had fun of doing triathlons with <laughs> mates since at different times, and uh, yeah, love that. And marathons, done seven bright marathons, wow. and uh, London Marathon. Love to do Berlin and Amsterdam, funnily enough. Yeah. And if Krakow have got one in Ottawa, I'll probably go and try and do that. That's, that's the next goal is international marathons. And you helped me on my running journey. So we, I barely got to, I did couch to 5K-ish, and I got to 5K, and then I went for a run the next weekend with Steve, and Steve took me to 10K. So I went oh, from 5K yeah, to yeah. 10K in consecutive runs, and that was thanks to Steve Pong. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, what a guy. Um, we are, this day, uh, Thursday is Mental Health Day, mm. so we will be showing a lo- lo- lots of content. Um, the feedback from this preacher, I feel weird saying this because it sounds like I'm blowing my own trumpet. That I, well, I've watched that in my trumpet. I had nothing to do with the preaching. Um, we just <laughs> the, I just get the content out there. But we've had some really positive. Um, Tim Jones um, oversees our, teach, our preaching and research department, mm-hmm. and he oversees the team that's involved with shaping preaching and uh, at Emmanuel. Uh, so really, I'm blowing your trumpet. Yeah, I'm saying this has been right a phenomenal right preaching right series, right so. um, and lots of really good uh, comments. I, I think, especially the preach that you did last Sunday, mm-hmm. where you spoke with the three hopes that we have hope, hope in uh, in mental health services, in the church and in Jesus, was just a brilliantly well-rounded preach where um, it acknowledged that, yes, Jesus has the answers and he, and he does that through the church, but he's also provided us with, um, oh, <laughs> and he's also provided us with, um, with, with services and, and the NHS uh, to look after people and to care for people. And he said, honor people who, who work in mental health and, and who, um, who serve people who, um, I, I, I guess struggling with, with various illnesses and, mm-hmm. and I thought that was massive because we're, we're not saying hey we've got everything and, and come to us and yeah. ignore the, the wonderful things that the world has to offer so I thought it was so well rounded mm-hmm. and, and thank you for just thank you for all the, the amount of time you spent preparing and, and shaping and, and, and teaching us so yeah well done really well done on Sunday but yeah sorry 30, what's your 30 second summary of the breach 30 second hmm <laughs> Wow, I, I think um, for me that what was I was I was actually blown away with the with the sense of response. So for me that just showed a lot of where people are at, mm. um, feeling very much. I think that was connecting with the people and where they're at, which was really encouraging. And I think that the theme of hope that very clearly came out of mm. Tim's and Alison's story, um, and then in a sense where I felt led to end up with with the with the song, there is a hope. We just realised, I think... Did you sing it at New England? Yeah, they, uh, Simon in the morning did. Simon no, did, did you sing it at the end of your preacher? You no, no, it? you don't want me singing it. That, that, that would kill hope right there. Wow. And then. <laughs> um, well, 
hope that most people feel, oh, actually, oh, maybe I can sing. That's different. No. Um, <laughs> no, I think uh, the, the sense of hope, I think, when mental illness comes, um, I know even I alluded to my experience in the, in the preach, I think it's very easy to get hopeless um, and lose hope in all of it. And, and so I think it was b- bizarre that I think I ended up coming so strongly to it. Um, and, and for me personally, again, even you, you find you, you live a preach, um, just even some of the hopefulness I have for even our situation with mum and stuff. Mm. Just, mm. Um, I've painted a picture of bleakness and even that's been challenged a little bit. I think, actually, no, that if Jesus is in all of this, then I should have hope and I should expect the things that Jesus does, even miracles, Brilliant. even joy, even laughter. And when actually, when I look forwards, I constantly was seeing dark things and yeah. difficulty and, and over-egging it in a sense. And I think, so again, bring, I think what Tim said about coming back to worship, coming back to Jesus and getting, recalibrating calor. I just, I think you just said something really important there because you, you as a pastor, were looking forward feeling bleak. Yeah. And a lot of people won't know that. A lot of people will think, you know, obviously he's always in the word and, you know, every trouble that comes along, he's, he's got a scripture to battle it or something like that. Mm-hmm. But you, you mean that genuinely, don't you? When your mum's diagnosis with dementia yeah. and walking through that road initially. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I quickly lean into that, actually, because, I, I mean, actually my strength a positive to you, I'm the encourager. But when I personally deal with things... I need my gift back at me and I don't necessarily give it back to me. I need someone else to come with it. Um, and actually I live in emotions. So having a wife who actually can come away from emotions and speak truth, but actually I need that in the, again in the church. So the needs I was speaking about, mm. you realize oh, I need that. I need that all the time. Mm. And yes, yeah, so I think again, even when you're engaging with a, a topic um, and then you're actually, oh, I'm living this. And then actually, but I'm not living in the good of this, then you go through a process. And I think uh, that's definitely what happened to me. And I, I do default to bizarrely negativity and sort of dramatic ends mm. rather than being a bit more rational and, um, yeah, hopeful. <clears throat> uh, others, I'll be quick to the hope. Really in my good. own life, I can live a different story sometimes. With us being in Mental Health Week, there's so much content out there. I was listening to BBC Radio One, and they're just mm-hmm. the interviews that they have on there. So if you do get a chance to, to check out some of the stuff that they have on, uh, I guess, I play at the moment, there's some brilliant stuff. On, and how could you you really help people with um, who are going through mental health issues? And, and quite often, it's stuff that people don't talk about. It's just in their minds, and, and they don't... They don't talk about it. They, they don't want to bring the conversation out. So I came across this thing on, on Instagram yesterday where this dad left a little note in his, I think in, in his in his daughter's room. So it said, if you ever need to speak about something, just bring me this this little card. And I know that we, we need to talk or I'd, I'd know that you just need me to be there with you. And I thought that was brilliant. Like, uh, what what would you say are, are some of the um, the ways we can, A, be sensitive, uh, and, and really serve and, and look out for people who, who have any mental health uh, issues amongst us. I, interesting what you say there, that's, that's huge actually. Because I've seen that modelled a number of times in the church where people come up with a system. So even on text, they'll do daily text and it's just red light, green light, amber, or thumbs up, thumbs down. And I think sometimes when you are, when you're under a bad day or you're really struggling, it's even an effort to, you know, we, oh, just tell me, why didn't you tell me? Well, I, I couldn't, mm. but I can, I can press a button, I can text, I can give you a sign, I can, if we've got an agreement of, it, do you know what I mean, it's helpful. And I, I think that, that, is, that is really huge to have people who you don't have to say more than it's hard or mm. yeah. that or that. Mm. I think sometimes that's really important because at that point then they know how, and I think often they've learned how to respond to you. They know what you need. They know that that may be just prayer. That may be just encouragement. Maybe let's go and have a drink. Mm. Let's find a context where I know you come Steve, alive. Quick practical on that. I know there'll be people listening who, to whom they tell that that's the lifeline I need. How do they, how do you get to that if you if you don't have that kind of context? Yeah. You don't mm. have that kind of relationship. Brilliant. That's really. Good. I mean, I <laughs> use the word journey a lot, but I think that's probably a bit of a journey, really. I think firstly. Obviously, in our church context, that's probably just telling someone I'm struggling and getting to a pastor because I think 
we, we can then help, you know, so even forming friendships or how do we, so that, again, it's things like, again, leading onto small group and getting, how can we get community either around you? Because sometimes the expectation is, well, you're coming to us. But sometimes, no, who could go to you, mm. and walk with you? So because Jesus is incarnational, but he also brings us into community and getting that balance right. But I think it's, it's just saying, I, even if you don't have what I've just said, saying, I need this. And us being able to go, right, how do we put that around you? How do we help you? And I think that's it. And then and then it's the ability for you again. Because I think often some people have lived with this so long that relationships have so broken down that even the idea of building a relationship would take energy, hope. And so how do we help you do that is even the start of the process. Because you may take a while to actually build some of those relationships around you. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it starts with, I need this help. Uh, and then I suppose for us as a church, it's then, well, how do we do that? And it, it, again, it's not making it complicated. It's just simple. Well, who knows you? Who, or, who, or who could connect with you? And then, and it, often it's around an interest or, you know, a desire that you both share. So it's not like, oh, I've got to go and sit with this person I have nothing in common with. No. The advantage of even being a bigger church at times is there's, I can often think of, oh, you'll get on with them or, I think maybe that connection and, and it'd be a joy to them so mm-hmm. i think that that mm. probably where I'd so to it. crystallize it there just i really want to make sure that people actually get yeah. that because he said it but it's just going going to a pastor going to someone who's who's there recognized within the sites of emmanuel or if it's another church going to to your pastor and realizing that actually they're kind of a gateway to a whole community mm. Uh, and I'll, you, you know, have your best interests at heart. They want to link you in. They want, they want to see you placed within a family there. So, mm. Mm. so would you say, if, if in conversation with somebody, you think, hold on a second, you need, you need more help than just talking to people within a community, what would you do with that? Okay. But well, I think, yeah, I think if the help is help, yeah. and I don't feel safe or I don't feel, then immediately we would we'd want to get you to a GP. Yeah. Um, and encourage you to and I think even that sometimes we have to say um, well when are you going to make an appointment ring them on the day have you made the appointment because even that's a step sometimes Mm. and I think there'll be a number in our fellowship where we've had to even that's a step process Mm. but uh, I can't really help you until you've got the right help Uh, and if you're feeling unsafe then you need to have and and again if, if you're right now you can't even do that and this is really unsafe okay well I'm going to have to ring an ambulance Mm. I'm going to I'm going to have to get you emergency care because your situation is an emergency. I'm not able to deal with that, but we have services that deal yeah. with emergencies all the time. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do for you. Yeah. Um, and hopefully I can get go with you or someone can go with you on that journey, even there. Um, but that's what needs to happen right now. Yeah. Um, as pastors and, and teachers, what would you say to somebody who is really struggling with, with let's say, depression and uh, and I was talking to a friend on Sunday after the service and, and they were saying how just getting out of bed is really hard and I I don't want to I don't have the strength to face the day I just mm. want to stay in bed all, all day what would you say to them what would what would you encourage them to do well, the fact that your friend yeah is important because I think again it's where if we have built some relationships then next Sunday that person doesn't come, they can't get out of bed or they don't turn up to small thing. You know, you notice they're not there. That they're known and they're missed. I think then there's a text, how you you're right, don't get a reply, okay, try again. I'm maybe I'm gonna go around. But there's a safety mechanism of relationship there. Um and I think it's the more you've put those relationships out, and again it's not just one, you want a few friends like that who would miss you. Because I might be away next Sunday, but they're not, and they notice you've gone. And so again, it's this painstaking ability to repair relationships, to build relationships around you, so that it's not all on me anymore. But it's also not all on them. Because mm. you can't, ultimately, some days, it's still up to you mm. to do the hard work of getting up, getting out of bed. That's, that's in a set, but often they're your friend again, they've managed to do that. Again, what you find is people are incredible and courageous to have got to where they've got to. And when you start unpacking a story like that, mm. you realize, so how long have you been like this? Oh, four years. Wow. 
Mm. How have you done that? That it's not a oh poor you or mm. it's you you find with these situations you're like wow there is strength in you there is there's a real fight in you. Yes, you don't feel like it. But I can see it because if I was in your shoes, I don't think I would have got out of bed. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we're fortunate. God gives us things to walk through mm. that He knows. You know, we can bear with His help. Mm. But I'm often finding myself going, I don't know how I do that. Mm. I, I don't know how you're doing that. And I think again, they expect you to probably have sympathy, or mm. actually, you know, I, I find the more you find these stories or these people talk to you, like you see it rightly. Yeah. Wow, that is incredible. What would you say to somebody who is in bed and doesn't have the strength to get out of bed? It's okay. Just rest. Yeah. Pray for you. Um, you know, <laughs> I had a book, I can't remember, it's Otberg, The Life You Always Wanted. He said, some days the most spiritual thing you can do is go to bed mm. and sleep. It's a lesson I didn't learn early enough, to be honest. But uh, but when you did learn it, you took it really seriously. Oh man, yeah, I have I have taken it very seriously. Yeah. Now I so in a very busy season now, yeah. I feel like my my days are crammed. I, the time I go to bed is pretty set. The time I get up in the morning is pretty set. It's difficult. Sometimes like yeah, I need to turn the alarm off. But I think the reality is I can take a nap. Where can I get space to rest? Where can I shut my eyes? Even if I don't sleep, again, even that the idea of oh, but I'm going, you know. If that's where you're at, then be there and I'm going to pray God's with you in it. Mm. Mm. And, and I know when I had a burnout and I was stuck on a sofa for a couple of weeks, I've never known God speak to me so wonderfully than he did in that moment. Wow. And, and again, it was a very spiritual time, mm. but I, I was able to do nothing. And I think when people, when friends saw me, I mean, I was never like that, Mr. Energy, they realized, oh, this is not the time to tell him to get out of bed. In fact, I'm glad he's in bed because he's, we've been wanting, you know, we've seen it in a sense. And, and friends, when you do that, you, so I think there's an element where you just recognize, I think this is right for you. There is a point where you realize, I think you can do more. Yeah. I think you're ready. How about today just getting up and just getting up for an hour and come for a walk with me. Um, let's have a breakfast mm. and then go back to bed. There's a point where we start walking out of the pit, but I think there's times where you don't want to pull people out of the pit mm. too soon because that's a God's doing something. He's either healing, restoring, or he's speaking. Mm. And you don't want to get into the conversation if, if that what's happening there is life changing. And I again I look at when I was in, in that bed, I, I, I keep going back to that time. The things he said there were very loud in my life and shaping, and I'm living in the good of it now. Someone could have said, Come on, Steve, and you know what? The people pleaser in me will probably have tried to get out of bed. But that would have been the work because what God was dealing with mm. me was people pleasing. <laughs> so yeah, I think it, 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 it's like I said with the Job thing, the bigger question is how is God using this? Yeah. What is God doing here? And we often see things wrongly and we don't understand again that God is profoundly doing things on the quiet, silently, like he did with Jesus. <laughs> changing the world, changing someone's life, and yet no one sees it, unless you're in it and then you see it, but then recognizing, oh, this is a God thing. This isn't a bad thing, this is a God thing. Mm. Uh, and therefore, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand by it, I'm gonna encourage it, I'm gonna pray for it, um, but I'm not gonna quickly change it. Brilliant. Um, we have had some questions in from the text number that we've been putting up on Sundays. So I'm going to just read um, one of these and open it up to you guys. Um, cool. Okay, this first one is, it's great that the church are getting on board slash informed with this huge issue that is so prevalent in our society. I have a daughter with special needs that has autism and severe anxiety slash challenging behaviour. Countless times I've been asked if I had considered that it could be demonic. This is really unhelpful and ill-informed. Where does the church stand on this? Tim. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, well, we can certainly hear the, the, the emotion in, in the question. Yeah, you can. So I don't want to, again, I don't want to be glib in the way that you, you pick up and answer something like this. I think we, we, we believe in the reality of a, a spiritual domain and we believe uh, that we live, we live our lives in light of the unseen and that's, that's the, the nature of what's going on here. But. It, I, I, I think I know where the question is coming from in terms of like a, a crass 
uh, correlation between uh, spiritual oppression and physical illness or mental illness. Mm. Um, uh, we, we, we wouldn't go to the extent of saying that these things don't occur together. We think that people are a, a unity. We don't, we don't really think that there's sections, if you like, a mind, body, and the spirit. We think that, mm-hmm. that the scripture deals with the person as a whole mm-hmm. um, and deals with the person not in isolation from other people or from spiritual forces. So mm-hmm. we, we wouldn't, wouldn't ascribe that. And then on the other, other hand, you, you'd say that um, there's there's a lot of mystery in the way that illnesses manifest and uh, I think particularly out of a sense of uh, worry there can be a reflex reaction in spiritually minded Christians uh, to see to see spiritual um, oppression behind every kind of physical manifestation especially especially more un- unusual things that affect people's behavior I think it can be tempting to make snap decisions there which uh, are not necessarily the case so I think that it's a complex issue I think so uh, it'd be right to say that sometimes you, you do have um, a spiritual oppression that manifests as a physical illness or as a mental illness for sure I think mm-hmm. that there's, it's a complex that's going on but to say that that's always and only the case is, is just too strong mm-hmm. so you got something on that, Steve? No, I just I think uh, again it's that we we're physical beings, so we always come down to the physical, but also we are spiritual beings, and I think particularly some people become so aware of that they they just constantly think spiritually as well, and I think sometimes that that question comes out of someone who is just become very spiritual or, or and I think that's the danger of Christian. Sometimes it's suddenly everything becomes spiritual, which is again not helpful as as. Uh, Tim says that we need to be able to put our feet on both both stones very clearly and understand that a person is a whole, but also a person is is who God has made them to be, and and that that there's something that He sees that we're learning to see. I think as a pastor, um, you know, with a child with say complex needs or disability, I mean, I work with disabled kids all the time. It's amazing how the the more you try you engage with the person, you stop seeing the disability. Mm. Brilliant. So I think with a with a mum, that question is so alien mm. because well, this is my child, mm. and, and I think there's a point at which you stop seeing a disability, not an out of denial thing, but because they're mm. they're Sam or they're Julian or they're mm. Francis, they're mm. they're not what you're seeing, which is a disabled child. And I I learned that. Wow. And I think mm. I learned there's always someone there. And it is incredible how you, you just cease to see. And I mean, and you cease to allow boundaries for some of those people because you think, if they desire that, I think they could do that. So mm. I spent my life doing that with disabled kids. You know, what could they do? But because you know them and know their character, you know yeah. what their desires are, you start to push away physical barriers out the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think parents um, can get misunderstood because they see their kids mm. as individuals. Mm. I think that's how God sees us. Um, and so, I, again, I think that question really judders because it's like I don't understand what you're because if you almost stop seeing the physical it's all relational mm. now mm. and, uh, and, and you, sorry, sorry I mean, and you can yeah. like focus on all the things that they can't do yeah when actually there's a whole bunch of things that they can do absolutely and they're quite incredible what they, the yeah. stuff that they can do I remember when we were dealing with a, an issue with one of our kids wisely with somebody it was James Foreman actually who counseled saying don't focus on the things that they can't do just look at all the amazing things that they can do and, and look at your child as as your child irrespective of the disability mm. and I think it was wonderful it just yeah. was very very releasing and I think as somebody is uh, when you when you it's so foolish to just brush through people who I guess who fall within a certain category and assuming everybody um, we would know that because we would say that about racism and a whole bunch of things that if you if you caricature an issue, you, you you miss out on the uniqueness and and something about that individual. So I just wanted to underline what you said. Yeah, brilliant. That's good. Um, we are coming to a close soon, but I just want to ask one more question. What are you putting your hope in for your mental peace? <laughs> yeah. ah. Not your singing. Gosh. Not my singing. No, oh, please <clears> not. <throat> <laughs> um. oh, my hope. In, well, I mean, uh, the. The answer is always Jesus, as we know this. So, uh, I guess it's more of a how. Like how, yeah. how are you doing that in this season of life? And I, th- I think it's important to acknowledge uh, that 
it changes from season to season. I can remember yeah. when John Hosier was here, he's one of the, the pastors, uh, when he first joined the church, and he said, you know, one of his life mantras was to always maintain a close walk with Jesus and recognize yeah. that it looks different from mm-hmm. season to season. Very good. Um, Very good. So assessing that, I'll just put the question back to Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. How are you finding your joy? In well, it's season? funny, I've been saying it to a number of people in the last few days, even on the back of that preach where you talk about hope, God's commitment to us, um, that he's the finished work of the cross, that he's left nothing, he's not left nothing to chance. And, and if we are living in the fullness of that, then where I am today is where God wants me. And I think that's really important. So I am, every day, right now where I'm at, I mean, like, you know, the, the weird thing of preaching after 10, you know, 10 years, he'll say I preach at Christmas, but... Um, <laughs> I didn't yeah, pull me up. But, <laughs> but in a sense for me, I could have spent the last 10 years thinking, oh, I'm not preaching, but I didn't. I, my, my season was posturing. Mm. What does that mean tomorrow? Does it mean I'm going to preach again? I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter. Is what, it? Uh, yes, just, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, what matters actually, it, and I, even I don't do, because I so died to that, but actually it's more, no, well, what does God want with me tomorrow? Well, I'm not preaching tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to be with people again and the next day. And so whatever I've got in my diary, whatever I've got planned, whatever I, when I'm with my kids and my family, I believe Jesus has got blessing for me and blessing and you wants to use me as a blessing for mm. whoever I'm in front of, whatever I'm doing. And he wants me to enjoy him and be happy and, and, and find his peace and his... So for me, I'm saying to a lot of people, you just need to know God's got you where he wants you mm. and he's given you everything for today. And, and, and again, we've, I think that's a mantra a little bit for this series is, mm. and don't worry about tomorrow, live in the good of what Christ has for you today. Certainly. It may be you lying in bed all day. Yeah. It may be you having the best, most productive day in the world, but both at the end of the day, you'll say, thank you that you mm. gave me grace for today. Certainly. And I think that brings a peace because then, oh, okay, so it's just day at a time, I can do that. Mm. Next year, five years, financial challenges, family changes. Ooh, no, today, mm. today. So good. Thanks so much. We've right. we run out of time. Um, just to say, if you are the manual, our, our small groups uh, kick off this week. So one of the big things is talk to people, get to know people, yeah. uh, engage with our community. There's hundreds of people who uh, are worth getting to know and a few not so much, but they are in this room, so that's okay. <laughs> Uh, we are manual.com forward slash small groups uh, and, and sign up to small group uh, and it is lovely. Um, next week, we are, well, this Sunday, we are looking at sex on your mind. And man, we've got some really powerful stories which we are going to drop on Instagram uh, this week. So look out for them. They're just oh, very, yeah. very moving stories of people just being really vulnerable with, with their journey. Uh, and then Matt Carville will be will be preaching to us on uh, how we can face anxieties around sex. Mm. So that's next Sunday, which we'll be unpacking at Live Lunch next week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. So good to have you with us, Steve Paul and Tim Jones. And see you next week. <laughs>